We're going to show you a number of demonstrations of how the in-memory technology works. We're going to run through how it works on small servers, large uh, scale-out servers, large scale-up servers, high availability, uh, how it compares to indexing technology and our current, uh, our current row-oriented technologies. So let's start first with the two-socket server, and we can see the basics of how um, this technology works. So first of all, let me explain to you what we're doing in this demonstration. So we wanted to have a demonstration that used real data and uses a lot of data and shows analytics on that data. So what we found is we could get real live Wikipedia search data. And the Wikipedia search data basically shows what searches people did uh, every day of the week for the last few years. And so we built a simple application on top of this that takes that Wikipedia search data and performs SQL analytics operation on it. And so I'll show you real quickly how this works. You type a search term into the search box, and it comes up with, um, and we will then graph the Wikipedia search data. And what we're graphing here is how many searches there were per hour, how many hits per hour on this search term. So I type Nadal, who was the winner of the recent French Open tennis tournament, and this shows me that uh, the number of searches per hour for Nadal between March uh, 23rd and 30th varied from about two to 400 per hour with a few spikes here and there. And what you see a lot of times is this kind of up and down, and that's really kind of a day and night kind of thing. There tends to be more searches during the day than at night. Okay, so that's what the demo is. It's, it's, we're, we're graphing the number of searches per hour, hits per hour, on a specific search term based on all the Wikipedia searches that occurred in a, in a given time frame. So let's talk about what we're doing here. So this first demo is showing how we would organize this using the technology that we had in 11G. What we would do in 11G if someone came and gave us data like this, and in this case we have one week of Wikipedia search data, which is about 4 billion rows, um, we, the first thing we would do is we would load that data into a database, and then we need to figure out what kind of queries users are going to run, and then we would create indexes, analytic indexes on the data so that those queries run fast. And that's what we've done in this first demo. We've done this how you would do this uh, with traditional 11G. So we can type a search term, and we can get see the graph of how it looks like uh, with if you have an analytic index built on it. And what you can see is, even though we have 4 billion rows, if you, if you um, type that another search term in here, even though we have 4 billion rows, with an analytic index, it runs essentially instantaneously. It runs in real time. So that's uh, the way you do it today. It works really well, but you have to know to create these analytic indexes. You have to know the data. You have to know the queries. You have to pre-create these analytic indexes. And then the analytics runs really fast. Okay, so that's that's what we do today. Now let's compare this a little bit to what happens with um, our new in-memory column store. So what we have here is on the top we have the exact same thing in red uh, running against the in 12C in-memory column store. On the bottom we have the index that we were just looking at. And what you can see here is as I type all these uh, search queries, we essentially get instantaneous results from both. So you see here the, the first real benefit of the in-memory column store, which is you don't have to pre-create these analytic indexes. Uh, you don't have to understand the data, understand the queries, and pre-create the analytic indexes. It runs really fast straight out of the box. So all we did here was enable the 12C in-memory column, and you got instantaneous results on the exact same data. So it's much simpler than what we had before. So now let's look a little bit about what if we had um, had not created analytic indexes. So here we have, again, the 12C in-memory column store on the top. And on the bottom, we also have 12C, but we're using the conventional row store. And in this case, we did not create the analytic indexes, but we are running the whole thing out of memory. So this isn't a comparison of memory versus disk. We have both running in memory, um, but one is using the new column store, which speeds up analytics. The other one's using our traditional row store. And as we've mentioned, the row store is really good for OLTP, but it's not as fast as the new column store for analytics for this kind of application. And what you see in the bottom here is that this graph is slowly painting. So while on the top, you saw that the 12C in memory column store was essentially inst instantaneously gave us the answer, on the bottom you see uh, the row store is also giving us the answer, it's just taking a lot longer. 
So with the row store, we're able to run about tens of millions of rows per second. That's about the speed that we're able to process data on one core. Uh, with the column store, we're able to process billions of rows per second. So in this case, we did 4 billion rows, and it runs so fast that you can't even tell how fast it is. It's basically instantaneous. And that's really kind of the big difference for analytics between the column store and the row store. It's much, much faster at doing this analytic processing. Uh, over here on the left, we see it'll tell you how much time faster it is. In this case, we're running about 700 to 800 times faster with the column store than the row store. And the row store hasn't even finished yet. It's probably take another couple of minutes to finish. Okay, so that's that's comparing uh, this new technology with the existing technology uh, for purely analytic workload. Now let's move on to something a little more complicated. We've we one of the things we say about our column store is that it works really well with OLTP. And this is a demonstration of that. So what we're doing here is we're running that same Wikipedia uh, example, but now we're inserting data in parallel. So we're running an OLTP application on the exact same table that we're running these queries on. And the, what we're doing here is we're inserting Wikipedia data in real time. So Wikipedia, if you look at, at the, the rates that people use Wikipedia, People are doing about nine, eight, nine, ten thousand searches per second. So it's a very, very busy website. And so we're doing the same thing here. We're going to insert data into the table at about eight, nine, ten thousand uh, searches per second. And the way we're inserting this data is meant to simulate a OLTP application. So we're not batching this data. We're inserting each row as it comes in uh, as a separate committed transaction. So every row comes in, it's separately inserted, separately committed, so it's really meant to model OLTP. It's not meant to model some sort of warehousing type environment where we're batching thousands of rows together and inserting them all together to reduce the overhead. So this is kind of the, the worst case, OLTP versus analytics. And so what you'll see here is uh, I can keep running this analytic query, and every time it runs, it's just running against more data. Here on the bottom left, we're showing that we're running now with 776,000 more rows than when this started a few seconds ago. And if we keep running again, now we're running with 838,000 more rows. So the analytic query is processing more and more data, and it's, it's processing it in parallel to the OLTP uh, inserting huge amounts of data per second, so eight, 9,000 rows per second, individually committed transactions. So what you see here is that our in-memory column store works really well with OLTP. The OLTP uh, uses the, the row store, the analytics uses the column store. The column store is very lightweight because it's all in memory and it's not persistent. And that means we can run very high rate OLTP and still run analytics on it. And it's basically instantly fast. There's no slowdown of the OLTP. There's no slowdown of the analytics. All right, so that's the, the um, demos I wanted to show on a two socket server. So now let's move to a much bigger system. So that, that, that was kind of a basic two socket server. Now I'm going to show you scale out on a much bigger server. So in this case, we have an Exadata machine, which has eight compute nodes. And I'm going to show you uh, how the in-memory column store works. And what's going to happen here is each of the nodes, each of the eight nodes, has one eighth of the data on it. So the way that in-memory column store works is the data is spread to the memory of all the nodes in the cluster. And then we run a parallel query that fetches the data from each of the nodes of the cluster and combines it. So at my previous example, I was showing one week of Wikipedia data. Now we have eight nodes, so we can show eight times as much data. So instead of one week, I have two months worth of data. Instead of four billion rows, I have 33 billion rows of data. So I have eight times as much data spread across eight nodes, and I'm gonna run the exact same demo with no changes. We just aimed it at this new system. And what you see here is we were able to process all 33 billion rows essentially instantly in real time again. And the reason is because they're all running in parallel and we're running against this uh, very efficient in-memory column store. So what I'm showing here is we can scale transparently across multiple nodes of a cluster. It works really, really fast with the column store. Okay, so that's scale out. Um, now I'm gonna show you uh, tiering. So one of the benefits of our column store is it's not limited by memory. You can combine memory, flash, and disk to get very big databases and also to keep costs low. So my previous example I used, uh, that I just ran, I used two months worth of data, which was 33 billion rows of data. Now I'm gonna use the resources in the entire Exadata machine. I'm not just gonna use the memory, I'm also gonna use the flash and the disk. And that means I can fit much more data into this example. 
So where before I had uh, two weeks and 33 million rows, I'm going to make this gigantic. I'm going to use six full years worth of Wikipedia data. So Wikipedia is an extremely busy website. I'm going to load every search term uh, searched on Wikipedia for six years, which uh, becomes one trillion rows of data. So it's a lot of data. This is a trillion rows of data. And what I'm going to show is I'm going to run the exact same application, and it's going to transparently use memory, flash, and disk, and it's going to give me the result, uh, and it works uh, transparently to where the data is. So here it is. Um, it wasn't quite as fast because it wasn't all in memory, but it just took a, a few seconds to complete. And that query ran against all the memory on, on this machines, plus the flash, plus the disk. It got the data from all of them transparently. It plotted it all out. Um, and what you see here is from 2008 to 2014, you see uh, much bigger spikes in uh, hits per hour and basically searches per hour. Uh, and the reason for this is because um, Nadal is a tennis player. Of course, there's big tennis tournaments during the year, things like Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, the French Open, uh, Indian Wells. And whenever there's one of these big tennis tournaments, of course, people get a lot more interest in these players, and so they look them up on Wikipedia. And you can see this very clearly plotted here uh, on this uh, display. And that's kind of one of the nice things about it is you can look at a trillion rows of data. You can look at the trends. You can look at what's happened year over year. You can look at what's, you know, when, when was the biggest uh, interest back in 2011, around mid-2011. You know, when is low interest? How long has the interest gone on for? All these kind of things are very simple to look at once you have this kind of analytic query. Um, and the key point here is, we're not limited by memory. Even a very gigantic system that has a trillion rows of data, all of Wikipedia search data, uh, we can run, and we can run it very cost effectively because we can use low cost disk in combination with memory to run all the queries. All right, so now um, I'm gonna show you the exact same thing, but in a scale out environment. So I'm using a very large SMP server here, which is an M632 which is a very large SMP server, a 32-socket server that um, Oracle Sun hardware division makes. And this is an extremely powerful server because it, it actually has 32 terabytes of memory in the single server. And what this means is that data that I just showed you, we're able to fit entirely in memory, that trillion rows, the six years of Wikipedia data, which was one trillion rows of DRAM, I'm now able to fit all this data into the single server all in memory because we're able to compress this data very effectively and uh, we only get you know a few bytes per row. And now when I run this query entirely in memory, you'll see that it actually runs extremely fast. So you see here, uh, we just uh, processed one trillion rows of data in real time. In about a second, uh, the thing ran. Uh, and that shows that we're able to scale up even on very large systems. So this system has 32 uh, uh, sockets, but it's 384 CPU cores, and it's 32 terabytes of memory. So it requires a very scalable database like Oracle to run on a system like this to scale to these very large CPU counts, these very large memory counts, and not get stuck on some contention point or something like that. Uh, and we're able to do that uh, very quickly and very transparently to the application. So let me type another search term in here. You see Nadal, these tennis, um, these tennis uh, players have very spiky results. We'll try something like a football or soccer player, Messi, who's a very famous player. Uh, you see that they also have spikes on the big tournaments, but they tend to have uh, larger uh, hits over, over time. And so this is an example of the kind of analytics, the kind of insights that you can get. You'd say, hey, tennis players, you really, if you were selling footwear or something, you really want to bring the tennis footwear forward only during uh, tournaments because that's when there's a huge amount of interest. With uh, soccer or football, there's kind of the interest is spread all through the year. It's not just little spikes, so you can keep those up front all the time. So just a quick example of the kind of uh, analytics you can get, the kind of uh, business insights you can get by looking at this data, by looking at a trillion rows of data, being able to plot it out over time, being able to search it uh, with instantaneous results. Okay, now I have one more thing I want to show, uh, which is a unique capability of, the or of uh, Oracle in memory, which is the fault tolerant capability. So... In Oracle Database and Memory, we can duplicate memory across multiple nodes of a cluster. So before I ran um, the eight-node cluster, and I showed how you can uh, run a distributed query across eight nodes, you get the result uh, almost instantaneously. Now, uh, one of the issues that uh, traditional and memory systems have had is uh, when a node dies, it takes all of its memory with it. 
So if a node dies, you suddenly lose all the data that's in memory. And what you have to do then is you have to reload that data on another node, and that can take a very long time. So in this example, to load 33 billion rows of data would take a long time to load into these other nodes. And during that time, you have, you're basically, your queries are going to run either really slow or not run at all. On most in-memory databases, they're not going to run at all until all that data is loaded into memory. Uh, we've done something very different with Oracle Database in memory. We have a fault-tolerant in-memory mode that allows uh, you to choose on a table or partition basis uh, tables or partitions that we want duplicated across all the nodes. And this works very analogously to how mirroring works on storage subsystem. So in a storage subsystem, you don't put your data on one disk, you mirror it across two disks so that if one disk dies, you can transparently use the other disk. Uh, similarly, with our fault-tolerant in-memory capability, we can duplicate the data across nodes so that if we, one node was to die, we could continue to run the query. And this is a very unique capability of Oracle Database in memory. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on one of these nodes, and that's going to trigger a script that will go out and crash the node. So when this finishes, um, that node is now crashed, and it's no longer available to run any queries on. However, because I've duplicated the memory across all these servers, I can still run my query. I don't have to wait for those 33 billion rows to be uh, reloaded. In fact, I see almost no performance difference. Uh, and the reason for this is I last one node out of eight. So this query that I just ran is essentially running about one eighth slower than it did. It's running seven eighths the speed that it was before. And it's almost imperceptible, the difference in performance. So you lose a node out of a cluster, you'll lose a little bit of performance, uh, but you'll immediately be able to continue running queries. There is no outage or slowdown that you experience. And again, there's a very unique capability that we've implemented in Oracle Database in memory. And it really is critical for uh, mission-critical applications. Uh, most mission-critical systems, you can't afford to take them down for an hour or two hours every time a node crashes to, to reload the memory somewhere else. Uh, and that's exactly what we're providing here. It's instantaneous failover to the remaining nodes. And you can choose this on a partition or table basis, so you can say, hey, I need the last year's worth of financial data available immediately, so I'll just duplicate that across the nodes. And you might say, well, for older data, um, you know, that stuff I don't need available immediately, so I'm not going to duplicate that so I can fit more data in memory. So you can choose uh, uh, to meet the business needs that you have and get extreme high availability. Okay, so uh, to conclude, I've shown you all the different aspects of our Oracle database and memory technology. I've shown you how it runs analytics really fast, comparable to the speed of analytic indexes, but without the need to create specific analytic indexes. I've showed you how the performance compares with uh, traditional row store for running analytics. It's much, much faster because it's able to scan columns with highly optimized uh, SIMD vector instructions. I've shown you how we're able to scale out across multiple servers. I've shown you how it works really effectively even though you have an OLTP application running against the exact same table that you're using the column store on. Again, that's very unique. Uh, most column-oriented architectures really can't handle OLTP at all. They can't handle single row inserts with commits or single row updates with commits at all. Or if they do, uh, it'll greatly slow down the, either the OLTP or the analytics or most likely both. So again, that's very unique in Oracle database and memory. The ability to scale out transparently uh, is very powerful. I've shown you the ability to tier the data across uh, multiple uh, tiers, so for memory to flash the disk to get very high capacity and very low cost and still get extremely good performance. I've shown you the ability to scale up to a very large server with 32 terabytes of DRAM, 384 cores, and get instantaneous responses. And I've also shown you our instantaneous fault-tolerant capability so that the system can keep running even if a node fails uh, with essentially no, not even a pause to the system. So, Thank you for joining me today. I hope you've uh, enjoyed watching our new Oracle Database and Memory Technology.